Well, thanks all and good morning. I'm glad to welcome you as well to this 20th year of this effort that we make every year to uh, discuss these important issues. I um, am Doris Meissner. I'm a senior fellow at the Migration Policy Institute. And I'm very pleased to introduce to you my fellow panelists this morning. Uh, beginning on my right with Ron Brownstein, who is a senior editor at The Atlantic, senior political analyst at CNN, um, Blas Nunes Neto, who is the assistant secretary for border and immigration policy and the acting assistant secretary for the Office of International Affairs, many big hats to wear uh, at the Department of Homeland Security. And then next to him, Angie Kelly, who is the chief advisor, policy and partnerships, for AILA, the American Immigration Lawyers Association. And then on the screen, uh, we have Linda Chavez, who is a senior fellow at Open Society, as well as at the Niskanen Center and president of the Becoming American Initiative. Linda is in uh, an undisclosed location <laughs> in Colorado. And uh, very, very pleased, Linda, to be able to have you join us uh, online. So the audience is here in the room, as well as a very sizable online audience. When we get to the question and answer period, we're going to ask those of you who are in the room to line up at these mics. So I'm telling you about them right now so that you can think about how to get there uh, when the time comes, if you have a question. And for those who are online, uh, those questions will come in, uh, whatever, across uh, cyberspace, and I will read them off of my iPad. Um, the way that we do this this morning is that this panel, which we call State of Play, has traditionally become the opener for this conference. And uh, uh, we name it something different each year. This year, we're naming it uh, Dynamism and Disorder. Uh, but it is our effort to try to do a broad overview of the critical policy developments of the past, past year uh, and how they look in shaping the challenges that are ahead. I'll give you just a few opening comments to frame and set the scene. And then I'm going to ask an opening question to each of our panelists. After they have an opportunity to make those opening remarks, we're going to go into follow-up and I hope crosstalk. This panel works the best when panelists speak with each other and pick up on each other's points. Uh, and then finally, we will have uh, uh, ample time, we hope, for questions from the audience. So with that, let me try to set the scene here. We're living in an era of massive and growing displacement globally. It's the result of wars, of failed states, of growing authoritarianism, climate disasters, post-pandemic weaknesses, poverty, and also real-time information for the first time for intending migrants through social media. For the United States, and for the Western Hemisphere, this mass migration as a region-wide dilemma is actually quite new. It's best exemplified by what's going on in the Darien Gap these days. Last year, 2022, there were a record number of 250,000 people who passed through the Darien Gap on their way to the United States. This year, and it's only September, we're already at 360,000. Next year, the predictions are that that number could go to 500,000, a half a billion, half a million. These are people from many nationalities, certainly from the hemisphere, but also from Africa and Asia. And they are accessing this route through what is really a seriously well-developed supply chain of almost entirely corrupt practices. When you take that then and look at the issue from the standpoint of the United States, there are so many issues that we could discuss. But the crisis at the US-Mexico border is the one that continues to suck the oxygen out of this, asserting new roles in immigration enforcement and policymaking and sending large numbers of migrants to large cities without family members or others that they know there to take them in. So as a result, the politics surrounding immigration have risen several notches in visibility and in rhetoric in our public discourse. With President Biden running for re-election, 
Republicans are making no secret of their intention to keep Democrats on the defensive on the issue of the border and ride it hard as a top tier campaign issue for 2024. So with that, let's start to talk in more depth. Ron, I'm going to ask you the first question. You've written extensively on immigration issues over many years, and lately you've begun writing about immigration, not only immigration itself, but as one of a group of issues that are part of a broader divide in the country that you're terming a nation within a nation. Tell us what you mean by that. What are you seeing? What accounts for it? What's brought us to this point? Thank you, Doris. Thank you for having me in, uh, on this great on this great panel. You know, I I first started writing about immigration covering Prop 187 in California, so uh, it has it has been a it has been a while. Um, uh, I think to you know uh, several speakers already have have noted the uh, increased assertiveness of red states on uh, on immigration and trying to uh, assert the right uh, to pursue policies uh, that depart almost completely at the other end of the spectrum from what the national government uh, is trying to do. And I think that has to be understood in a much broader context, because what we have seen uh, since 2021, um, uh, trickling before that under the under the Trump presidency, but certainly accelerating under the Biden presidency, is an attempt by virtually every red state, every state where Republicans have unified uh, control of government, to set their own rules on a broad range of civil rights and civil liberties issues. I mean, if you look at abortion, if you look at voting rights, if you look at LGBTQ LGBTQ rights, classroom censorship, book bans, public protests, a whole range of issues uh, in which red states are moving aggressively and uniformly, you know, kind of uh, in sync um, to uh, 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 restore a kind of pre-1960s vision of America in which your rights and liberties varied enormously depending on your zip code. Um, the, the general trend in American life since the 60s uh, has been to nationalize more rights uh, on every front, uh, much of it through congressional action, uh, much of it through Supreme Court decisions. Um, we are beginning to see that dial turn back the other way and wider divergence opening between the basic rights available to citizens depending on where they live and immigration falls very much within that um, overall construct, particularly uh, in in the border states. You know, we've seen uh, with Operation Lone Star in Texas. Uh, a variety of, of, um, uh, of policies. I'm going to talk about more about this in, in greater depth later. Uh, in which the state government is trying to insert itself into responsibilities that have historically been reserved to the federal government. The symbol being the razor wire along the border at the Rio Grande and the boys in the in the in the river uh, itself. Uh, Doug Ducey, when he was governor of Arizona, wanted to build his own border wall with uh, you know uh, freight box cars uh, and Florida under DeSantis has passed a law that recalls the show me your paper law in Arizona uh, from uh, from the Obama era, but is in, in many ways even more severe, offering criminal penalties to anyone who transport uh, transport an undocumented migrant in the state. The, uh, the Biden administration has pushed back against some of this to an extent. Um, they uh, they they pressured Doug Ducey to remove the boxcars. Uh, they have sued uh, Texas over the, the the barriers in the Rio Grande itself. But notably, that lawsuit did not include the razor wire on the shore. And the Biden administration, uh, as far as I know, has not joined the litigation uh, that um, private you know, public interest law firms and so forth and civil rights groups have filed against the Florida uh, legislation. And I think that reflects the political calculation, and I'm sure we're going to talk about this, uh, of the administration overall, uh, which has tried to be responsive to concerns of uh, immigrant advocates, but is also very much keeping one eye 
on the Republican opposition and the case that they are prepared to make against Biden in 2024, that he is in effect open the borders. And I will just close by saying that with all of this occurring and all of this tension with red states that are moving uh, to uh, try to commandeer more authority to set their own immigration policy. And by the way, this is an area where traditionally the Supreme Court uh, has provided almost, has deferred almost completely to federal authority over states, certainly in the Arizona case, uh, not that long ago. Um, there is a sense I, th that that um, that the red states may be looking, much as Mississippi did on abortion, for a case that will allow the court to re-examine re those earlier decisions and go in a different direction. But having said that, with all of that as the backdrop, all of this conflict with the red states that, that is ratcheting up, what is looming as the as the kind of intergovernmental relationship that is likely to have the biggest impact on 2024 is not any of this. It is the growing tension with the democratic cities that are becoming the, um, the kind of the you know the the recipients of large numbers uh, of these of these migrants and getting that right with the mayors of New York and Chicago and Philadelphia and the other cities that are dealing with this influx, uh, I think is probably going to be more important for Biden, the Biden administration in 2024, than finding uh, you know, some sort of uh, uh, solution or agreement with Texas on Operation Lone Star. So I will stop there. All right, those put some very good points on the table. The getting it right is certainly something we should come back to. And um, you know, the basic issue of federalism and federalism under uh, uh, real challenge uh, is an incredibly important longer term uh, trend here. So, Blas, let me turn to you and um, uh, no, say what everybody knows, and that is that the president announced a set of policy changes in January that went into effect after uh, the end of Title 42 in May uh, that represented a sharp shift from the policies and practices of the first two years. What's the theory of the case that the administration is making? Um, and, and tell us where you think we are. Uh, what's your latest assessment of what's working, what isn't working, what additional measures can or might um, uh, we see? Give us the state of play. Sure, and, and thanks for uh, uh, the invitation to participate today. Um, I think, uh, as you noted in uh, May, we started implementing a new um, set of policies um, that essentially seek to disincentivize migrants from putting their lives in the hands of smugglers and crossing our border uh, unlawfully, and instead provide legal, safe, orderly pathways for uh, intending migrants to come directly to the United States. Uh, some of those include the uh, supporter-based parole processes for nationals of Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. Uh, we also announced the CBP-1 mobile application at the border, which is allowing us to process uh, four to five times as many uh, individuals at our ports of entry as we have been historically uh, able to uh, even prior to the pandemic. Uh, and the theory of the case is essentially that, which is uh, that we uh, believe uh, quite strongly that individuals have a right to asylum uh, in this country, and we are prepared to offer safe and orderly means for people uh, to come and access the asylum system. But uh, we can't uh, allow individuals to cross uh, unlawfully at the border in the in the numbers that we have seen uh, over the last few years. And so, you know, we have put in place measures, again, that seek to channel those flows into more orderly uh, processes. I will say, though, you know, that it's important to take a step back and just note that what we are seeing today is, uh, and this word gets tossed around a lot, but I think it's absolutely the case, it's unprecedented, right? When we, uh, when our immigration system was last updated by Congress decades ago, 98% of our encounters at the border were nationals of Mexico, and they were individuals who, you know, came to work seasonally and went back. And a very small fraction of the people were not Mexican and, and you know, wanted to access asylum. And so we created a system that was really very generous 
uh, in giving oppor individuals the opportunity to claim asylum in the U.S. You know, we saw uh, these uh, demographics start to shift at the border uh, really about 10 to 15 years ago with a, a surge of migration from the northern Central American countries. Uh, and under the uh, Obama administration for the first time really ever, we saw more uh, non-Mexicans at the border than Mexicans in 2016. Uh, and that uh, was entirely driven by nationals of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. Uh, this past year, for the first time ever, uh, we have seen the majority of encounters come from countries other than Mexico or the Northern Central American countries. And that is putting just an incredible amount of pressure on our system. Uh, most of those individuals, uh, you know, claim asylum uh, either at the border or in the interior of the country. Uh, and even though at the end of the asylum process, very relatively small proportion of people who go through that process actually get granted asylum. But because of the way politics have shaped the discourse in this country around the border, what we've seen since the early 1990s is you know, a cycle where there's a perception that the border um, is out of control and uh, Congress uh, provides a great deal of resources to our frontline personnel. Now, this happened while you were at the INS and it has happened cyclically since then, uh, but we have not actually funded the rest of the system anywhere near as much. And so what we end up with is a system where the real world incentive structures are the complete opposite of what the statute envisions, which is we are least generous to those who are willing to wait and come to the US using a legal pathway. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, most generous to those who arrive uh, unlawfully and, and claim asylum, because that process now takes four to six years uh, to go through the process. And obviously, you know, for obvious reasons, we don't want people to become a public charge. And so uh, we allow them to work during that process. But that has really turned into uh, a new way for people just to come uh, and work uh, in the United States. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is... Uh, just the reality that we are are facing with uh, today. And so um, I say all of that um, because we, we have, as Doris noted, taken a series of steps, but we are uh, clear-eyed that there really is no lasting solution here that does not involve congressional action. Uh, we have seen now going back, you know, three or four administrations, presidents from both parties trying to address this issue at the border through executive action. Uh, we have done that ourselves, and we're obviously committed to continuing to do that. But what that has really done is invited the courts uh, to come into uh, this space and really start to dictate border and uh, immigration policy in the country in ways that are often contradictory and that make it extraordinarily difficult to actually manage uh, what we are are seeing. Um, so we we really do need um, an, a whole of of society approach here, one that includes you know, uh, obviously NGOs, uh, private stakeholders, but uh, the U.S. Congress uh, as well. Um, and one of the things I, I should have noted, and, and Ron, you, you referenced this, is that, you know, because of the changing demographics and because we're seeing uh, nationals of countries we've never really seen before at the border, uh, these are people that don't have familial ties in the U.S. And so when they come, they don't have anywhere to go. And that means that they are vulnerable uh, to programs like what the state of Texas is doing, which is kind of forced busing of people to the interior. But it also means that they end up uh, often in homeless shelters or in unhoused conditions. And, and that is just a, a huge policy challenge, you know, obviously for us in the federal government, but for uh, states and local governments throughout uh, the country. I think the, the last thing I would note um, is, you know, Doris referenced the Darien uh, jungle. Uh, you know, I was just there two weeks ago, uh, and I can say that you can intellectually think you know what is happening there, but until you physically go there and see just how impenetrable that jungle is, how large and rugged the mountains are that people cross, uh, and then you see, you know, families with really small children, babies, <clears throat> you know, kids in diapers coming out of that jungle after having walked for four or five days with no food and little water, just in really dire conditions and ending up in this little indigenous village of 200 people with no running water or electricity 
it is heartbreaking and it is a humanitarian catastrophe and also an ecological catastrophe because that is an unspoiled stretch of jungle that is quickly becoming uh, spoiled. And so we, I think, have a, a humanitarian imperative to stop what is happening in the Darien. Uh, and we are obviously working with partner governments throughout the region to try to address that. Um, it is a huge challenge. I think what we've seen through social media is just the, the role that smuggling networks are playing in uh, shaping these flows and spreading sometimes accurate, sometimes inaccurate information about what's happening in order to drive migration uh, and to put people's lives at risk. And we are unfortunately increasingly seeing uh, drug cartels and really serious transnational criminal organizations becoming directly involved in the movement of people, which is a huge uh, change in how things historically worked in this space that is obviously troubling uh, because of the lack of regard for human life that the cartels have, but also for the way that they destabilize governments throughout the region. And you're seeing that right now uh, in the Darien and you know, referenced in that New York Times article. So the the scale of the challenge is frankly enormous. Um, but you know, I think we showed with the policies we created after uh, we put in place after the lifting of Title 42 that there is a vision that can work in this space. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think, uh, the politics here really dominate the discussion from both um, political extremes, I would say. I think most people uh, are actually pretty reasonable when it comes to the border, but unfortunately in the public discourse, those voices tend to get drowned out um, by others. And so I, that is the real challenge I see is how do we uh, you know, lift up the middle ground here and come to an actual common sense solution. I think there are ways to do that and we're committed to doing it, but we need uh, willing partners to work with, with that. Let's talk there. Okay, well, thank you, Blas. Um, <clears throat> that certainly um, lays out very graphically what the difficulties are and that the administration recognizes the enormity of the challenge. But no matter what, I'm turning to you, Angie, because the polling for the administration on these issues is very negative. And it shows that um, border control is a serious weakness uh, for this president going into a reelection period. You've been in the administration and you're now out um, uh, seeing some of these policy changes in action. And you see the kinds of tensions even prior to this issue of the cities that um, dealing with immigration creates among democratic constituencies. Those tensions are on steroids now. And um, so what do you think uh, as a political strategist uh, the administration can do to reduce the political costs of the current and continuing large numbers? What kind of a message does Biden go to the public with on immigration, given the polling numbers and what they show? Thanks, Doris, for that really easy question. <laughs> I am clearly under-caffeinated, um, but I'll do my best. Um, so I, I think of this, there's like three big points I want to make. Um, let's talk about Biden's policies, what he's doing, but what he's not saying. Uh, I want to talk about advocates and opponents and what the messages are that are breaking through. And then I want to talk about what's needed, which I think of as like a home base, like when kids are playing tag, but you can get to home base and you're safe there. I think what we need is a home base. Um, so let's start with the administration. Um, this administration is actually remarkably forward leaning on immigration policy, but it's fragile and it's outsized relative to its resources. It's fragile because there are internal dynamics and disagreement within the agency and the White House that play out all the time. This is laws is every day. And it's and there are external circumstances that also make it fragile, like the numbers of people coming to the border. It's outsized because there's a lot of policy change happening, but there's not a lot of people and there's not a lot of money and resources to be able to do it certainly not in the time frame that the press reports on it and that advocates demand. This is gonna be a long haul, guys. And we have to, we have to think of it as a marathon. Um, what this administration has done that it doesn't talk a lot about, it doesn't get much blowback either, which I think is interesting, is it's really modernized family immigration in that now we have family parole programs that have been greatly expanded. So if you have a family member here, you can come more quickly. 
It's expanded employment, particularly H-2As, H-2Bs, and also employment-based visas are now being used in greater numbers than before. There are more people covered with TPS than under pre any previous administration. That's significant. There are 2 million Americans that have come forward and said, I want to sponsor. I want to sponsor an immigrant, a Ukrainian, an Afghan, Cuban, Haitian, Venezuelan, Nicaraguan. 2 million Americans are sending the demand signal that we can be a welcoming country, but there has to be certain conditions. The numbers of refugees that are uh, coming into the refugee resettlement program also growing. CBP-1, not perfect, but we've set up an orderly process for people to come in with an appointment. There's a lot that's not good about what this administration has done. If you look at it through the narrow lens, it's an important lens, but it's a very narrow lens of asylum seekers. I get that. I represented many vulnerable asylum seekers. But even with the difficult circumventing legal pathways rule, there are a significant number of exemptions of people who are still able to come in. Another thing that the administration's done well, but I don't think it's a lot of attention, and I hope Laws can talk about it, is everyone had their eyes on the end of Title 42. We were certain the numbers were going to go up. There were more cameras there than migrants, though, after Title 42 came down. And why is that? I think part of the secret sauce is that the administration disrupted the business model of smugglers and was able to talk directly to migrants. And I know of private polling that's been done of people in Northern Triangle countries who say, we know we can't come because of the five-year bar. We know we can't come because we need to get an appointment. So that message is actually breaking through to migrants in their countries. And I, I think that's key because the bet that this administration has made, right, the cocktail that they're trying to perfect is can we have legal pathways that are wide enough for people to choose to wait so that they can come lawfully with a visa and not a smuggler? So this is all great, right? A lot of what I've described, and there's many people who are going to disagree with my analysis, but the, these are the facts too. And these are the facts that don't break through. And why is that? Because this president is wildly uncomfortable with this issue. He is overpromised when he was a candidate. I oversaw the transition team's work on immigration, so I know very well what he promised, and he underestimated the blowback. So he is not speaking up because he's not comfortable, and that leads to my second point. What are, the, what are the advocates and what are our opponents saying? You all know the Republicans' message, right? It's easy, it's united, it pounds away that the border is open. It pounds away at that over and over again. Now, advocates, the way our field now looks, and I've been in it for many decades, is we have a very robust activist wing that's loud, but not particularly large in terms of representing the segment of the American people's opinion on what we should be doing about immigration. The pragmatic progressives, like the center of this movement, have been, has atrophied, and we have fewer voices that are coming forward with solutions. We're not speaking up. And there are people on the center right, their voices have been completely overtaken by the Trump dogma on immigration. And we all know what that is. And that awaits us, by the way, if Biden doesn't win the next election. My former colleagues at CAP, um, Rui Teixeira and John Halpin, did a really interesting survey project that I urge you all to look at. And it was looking at like, what are some of the big issues that are going to come forward in the 2024 election and what are the democrats what are the democrats positions on it and where does that sit relative to the center and most of the electorate including in their party so on the question of immigration if you ask people you say people around the world have the right to claim asylum and america should welcome more immigrants to the country right it sounds good fewer than 25 percent of democrats actually support that position America needs to secure its borders and create more legal and managed immigration paths to bring in skilled professionals and workers to help our economy grow. Nearly 60% of Democrats support that. America needs to close its borders to outsiders and reduce all levels of immigration, only 17%. Most though of what breaks through in terms of where advocates are is that first message. But most of where the American public is and where one time was a really robust central left movement was in the middle message. 
And I think that's how we get to home base. So let's talk a little bit about that. We need policy solutions, a communication strategies, and we need stakeholders from across the political spectrum that will say a meta message in support of immigration. If we stay at a high level and a meta message, we win the American public. They wanna have legal immigration that builds on family relationships and workers with protections that get to come to the US. The American public wants legal status for 11 million people as long as they pass background checks, pay taxes, and learn English. The American public supports an enforcement of a system that balances control with compassion. That has to be fair, but also has to be fast and final. That's the comprehensive immigration reform of many year ago, but a 2.0 model that also addresses the conditions that Blas has described. And it has to be catalyzed and driven by pragmatic progressives that reach across the aisle to centrist conservatives. So that to me, Doris, is the way forward. We draw contrast to those, mostly in the Republican party who have no solutions. We emphasize legality and we point to what Biden has done and we say more please. That's my thoughts. Okay, so Linda, we're going to turn to you now um, in order to understand better the other side of the aisle. Um, I want to say at the outset that uh, you're no longer a member of the Republican Party, but you have been a keen observer of right of center politics and struggles over immigration issues for a very long time. So we want you to draw on that wisdom and knowledge and tell us about the factions as you see them within the right, center right, and uh uh, and, and across the conservative spectrum on immigration issues, and definitely what role you see this issue playing in 2024 elections. Will it again be a central strategy the way, the way it seems to be? Um, is it a winning strategy? So what needs to happen? What do we need to understand about conservatives and conservative thinking on this issue, on this issue, on this issue, on this issue? Uh, let, let me just say that it's clear uh, that immigration is going to be a factor and an issue in the 2024 election. Uh, those who watched the first uh, debate um, with uh, Republican candidates uh, saw that uh, they were pretty uniform in their opposition to the Biden administration's approach uh, on uh, immigration, uh, but they weren't really uh, into trying to propose any kind of real solutions uh, other than perhaps invading Mexico for the fourth time uh, in US history uh, and taking on the drug uh, cartels, uh, which in my view is a non-starter. I, I mean, I think the, the real problem is that there are so many misconceptions with what has happened at the border, what is happening internally in the United States, uh, because of the kind of media coverage that we see, uh, there is a sense that literally millions of people are pouring into the United States uh, who do not have permission to be here. And uh, we look at the numbers, the 2.4 million number of, of people who were uh, encountered at the border last year, uh, this is a number that the anti-immigrant forces uh, actually inflate uh, and claim that, frankly, um, there are twice that many people uh, who have come into the United States. And so that kind of misinformation, there's very little pushback. Um, I am a senior fellow now at the National Immigration Forum and the National Immigration Forum and other uh, groups have, in fact, tried to push back to show that the encounters at the border do not equate to people actually coming into the United States, even on a temporary basis uh, and being here. Um, Doris, thank you for your organization's work on updating uh, the number of people who are undocumented in the United States and living here, which had fallen to about uh, 11 million and which have now increased uh, last year. I think the number that you um, were able to come up with was 11.2 million. Uh, 200,000 more people living here is not 
2 million more people living here. And I think that's one of the reasons we cannot have a productive debate on this issue. The second misconception is that the people who are in fact being allowed, uh, even on a temporary basis, whether that it's uh, types of parole or whether they are applicants in the asylum process are illegally present in the United States. And of course we know that's not true. Um, our asylum laws, in my view, need uh, a hard look. I don't think that all of the people who are coming in and claiming asylum uh, will, um, and, and you've already suggested this, they won't be granted asylum because they don't meet the definitions in the law. But the law says that while those claims are being adjudicated, they can, in fact, be present here. And I think the tension that we've seen is um, really what's happening. And of course, the Republicans have been very good at this, at um, moving people uh, out of border states uh, and moving them north and to uh, big cities where Democrats uh, happen to be mayors. And that's kind of um, gotten uh, the attention uh, even among Democrats. And that's why you're seeing the kind of polling data, I think, that you are among Democratic voters. But the bottom line is that none of what concerns Americans can be fixed by the administration. Uh, it can only be fixed by Congress because, in fact, we have an outdated immigration system, one that we have not seen a major overhaul in uh, since uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, the president uh, in whose administration I worked. And that's a very long time ago, 1986. Uh, I was recently going back and writing a piece um, I, that I think will appear later today or tomorrow in the bulwark about uh, Judge Hannon's decision uh, on the Dreamers. And one of the things that I did was to go back and look at the way in which uh, President Reagan, even as a candidate, talked about this issue. And I found a quote from him from his debate with Walter Mondale, in which he said, I believe in amnesty. I think that statement um, is something that is unfathomable for any Republican to issue today. And yet, without uh, our dealing in some way with the 11.2 million people who are undocumented and living in the United States without dealing uh, with the fate of the dreamers, uh, who frankly are now much more than ever under the sword of Damocles, um, which Judge Hannon has uh, issued just inches from their necks uh, in his latest decision, uh, without dealing even with groups that Americans supposedly welcomed a couple of years ago, namely Afghans. Um, we haven't yet passed the Afghan uh, Readjustment Act, or our Afghan Adjustment Act, I should say. Um, and um, all of these things show the kind of paralysis that exists in the United States Congress. You no longer have the voices um, of people uh, like the uh, 2013 version of Marco Rubio or Lindsey Graham. You don't have Republicans who are willing to stick their neck out and talk about the fact that you cannot solve the issue of illegal immigration until you solve the issue of reforming legal immigration. It is um, amazing to me that um, people have not made a bigger point of the way in which the uh, flow of immigrants into the United States has traditionally been a bulwark against inflation. Uh, this administration uh, is challenged not just by its policies at the border, but it's challenged on the issue of inflation. And in fact, I think it's been demonstrably shown over the years that um, the uh, presence uh, of immigrants, the influx of immigrants in the United States has been one of the reasons why uh, our economy has succeeded. And yet again, no one is making that issue. Uh, Angela brought up uh, the elephant in the room, Donald Trump, uh, and his role and what that's going to be in 2024. 
and whether or not he's going to be able to do what he did in 2016, which was to make immigration the focal point of uh, his campaign. I don't think that's going to happen this time. I think he is the presumptive nominee of the Republican Party, but I think he is so obsessed with relitigating the 2020 uh, election uh, that he uh, is not going to spend the kind of time that he did. Uh, and because of that, I think the immigration issue, while it will certainly be out there, there will certainly be all of the horror stories we're going to get you know, more so-called angel moms and others uh, paraded uh, on TV and, and uh, with telling stories about how uh, they've lost family members as a result of, of crime by uh, people who are undocumented in the United States, which again, those of us who study this issue know is simply not representative since uh, immigrants in general uh, commit fewer crimes uh, than uh, native born Americans do. But it is going to be uh, an issue. It is going to be something that's debated. I will say that I give credit uh, to the Biden administration uh, for uh, being willing to do what they can through their executive powers uh, to be able to make changes to try to streamline the process uh, for asylum. Uh, to try to give people who want to come to the United States the opportunity uh, to apply in different ways uh, to um, before they actually show up at the border. All of those things are good. The one thing that I do fault um, President Biden for, and I think Angela touched on it a bit, is I think he is uncomfortable with this issue. Um, unlike someone like George W. Bush, uh, who was governor of a border state, the issue of immigration has not been front and center uh, with um, Pre President Biden in his political career. It's just not been his focal point. And therefore he's not, uh, I think he, he doesn't speak with the same kind of passion. Um, I think he did probably overpromise um, uh, when he was uh, a candidate and even when he first came into office. And part of that is because I think he just doesn't um, really get this issue in the way that uh, other uh, presidents have. I, I faulted President Obama for the same thing. I thought he was not. Um, he, frankly, I, I still fault him uh, for having been elected and having uh, both the, uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate in control of Democrats uh, in his first two years in office, and he chose not to make immigration reform. Uh, a top priority, uh, focusing instead on getting health care uh, for Americans. But I think that failure meant that we lost the last real opportunity to get something passed. Um, I look right now, and I think that uh, even though I think comprehensive immigration reform is the only answer to solve the problem of illegal migration into the United States, I don't think we're going to see a comprehensive uh, bill anytime soon. And so the, then the question is, can you gather support? And this is going to uh, mean uh, enlisting uh, the support of moderate uh, Republicans or even conservative Republicans who, like I do, uh, have an understanding of the important role that immigrants play uh, in our economy without enlisting their support, um, you're not going to see it happen. But I do think you're going to have um, the possibility of seeing some piecemeal legislation pushed through. And I would say that the uh, three areas where you might see some progress is, I hope, with the, the Hannon decision out of um, Texas uh, and in the Fifth Circuit now, it will be appealed to the Fifth Circuit, uh, that Hannon's uh, decision will push the dreamers issue forward. You're talking about 600,000 young people, average age of 29 years of age, most of them have some college education who are out there working in the workplace, paying taxes, joining the military and leading responsible lives. I think even conservative Republicans, even Trump voters don't want these people ripped out of their communities and deported. So there might be some progress on dreamers. 
I think the Afghan Adjustment Act uh, is another area where you might see some progress. And of course, that bill has been reintroduced uh, uh, this summer. And then the final area I think you might see some uh, more progress is in expanding the ability of people to come here to work temporarily. Certainly, um, that's something that uh, even uh, Republicans in red states understand in certain industries like uh, agriculture, uh, like the meat processing industry, that without those workers, uh, not only uh, would uh, their jobs disappear, uh, but uh, they would have a kind of domino effect and communities in red state America would have a devastating consequence if, um, if we cannot get um, the ability of people to come here on a temporary basis to work. So I continue to be optimistic. I could not have been uh, working on this issue as I have for 40 years uh, if I didn't have some optimism, but I think it's gonna take an effort on both sides of uh, the aisle and that Democrats, um, I'm hopeful uh, that those uh, more centrist um, Democrats uh, will be able to figure out a way to work with the few uh, Republicans who are willing to take on this issue and at least to see some progress uh, on those specific areas. Thanks. Linda, uh, there certainly is agreement across the board, as always, that legislation has to be uh, has to ultimately uh, happen. And if it happens in bits and pieces, that's better than not. But it is also the case that, uh, uh, just sticking with you, Linda, that the the points that you've made about DACA and about uh, temporary workers and agriculture, as well as the Afghan Adjustment Act, have been in the mix and have been being uh, talked about. Bills have been proposed, et cetera, and um, and there's just no take. So, what you know, quickly, what would have to change in Republican ranks in order for even those small bites to make progress? Not not make progress happen. Well, I think that um, you, uh, I don't know that if the Republicans uh, maintain control of the House of Representatives that you're going to see any progress on anything. Um, and I say, um, you know, that I say that somewhat reluctantly, even though I'm not a Republican, I agree uh, with Republicans on a lot of issues, uh, not immigration, certainly, but there are other issues with which I do, I do agree with them. But I think um, if uh, the uh, Republicans lose control um, of uh, the House of Representatives uh, in the next election, that you are more likely uh, to see uh, some movement. If Donald Trump uh, is elected, then all bets are off. And then I think we go back and it will no longer be 2024 uh, in the United States. It will be 1924. And we will see the kind of xenophobic, anti-immigrant, uh, wave uh, that we saw at the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, I think that would be a, a tragedy. All right, so elections matter. They absolutely matter. And that is a very um, bracing answer. Thank you very, very much. Um, I, 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 we're we're um, running short on time. And so I wanna give any of you a chance to pick up on points others have made. Um. Well, I'll jump in. You know, there was kind of a test case of what Linda was talking about. At some point during the Trump administration, uh, Chuck Schumer and Dick Durbin, among others, offered the administration a deal that they would provide funding for uh, finishing the wall in return for legal status for, for DACA. And that deal died because the Trump administration also demanded the largest cuts in legal immigration since 1924 um, against the backdrop of the decade of the 2010s being the second slowest population growth in American history, right? The, from 2010 to 2020, the population grew slower than any other decade in American history, except uh, for the depression. And in the midst of that, the Trump administration demanded, and at various points, a significant majority of House Republicans and, and Senate Republicans voted for the largest cuts in legal immigration uh, against the backdrop of worker shortages in red states 
Um, and of course, one of the reasons now we are dealing with inflation at the uh, uh, interest rates at the level we are uh, is because the Fed is frustrated by the inability to get inflation under control. One of the reasons they can't get inflation under control is because of worker shortages that are, uh, you know, employers are, are saying are forcing them to, to pay more. We can debate, you know, the, the value of that. But nonetheless, it is a period in which you can argue that all Americans are paying a tax of higher interest rates for the failure to bring in more people to the US. And yet there is still support in Republican ranks for cutting legal immigration. Forget about the proposals that we are seeing to essentially end the asylum process that, that passed the House or to use force uh, against Mexico. And that is just the reality that in the modern Republican coalition, the objection to immigration is fundamentally cultural rather than economic or even public safety. Over 70 percent of Republicans consistently say in polling now over a number of years that the growing number of immigrants threaten American traditions and values. And that is a you know, that is just a, a, a rock in the road toward getting any meaningful uh, cooperation. So, you know, in many ways, I think that if if democrat you know a slightly different you know from angela in that in that i think democrats are going to have to solve this largely on their own that doesn't mean uh that doesn't mean there still isn't a span of opinions to work with but i think that so long as republicans believe there is value in portraying the borders out of control and they have you know they have uh, evidence they can use to make that case um you're not going to see much effort to solve the problem from them well, I'm really glad, Ron, that you made that point about um, uh, the gut feel on this, because at the end of the day, these issues always have been, and they are particularly now, issues of identity, issues of change, issues of who we are well, as a country. I, and I forgot to make it real quick. I know I don't want to monopolize the time. A really important point in all of this and why this is evolving the way it is in the Republican Party is the fact that Donald Trump between 2016 and 2020 took all sorts of unprecedented steps that were harsh in unprecedented ways, culminating in separating parents from their kids at the border. And his performance among Latino voters improved from 2016 to 2020. And that doesn't mean they necessarily supported those policies. It means that for there were a, a number of Latino voters for whom that was not sufficient reason not to vote for someone who they thought was better on other grounds such as the economy. And there is, I think, a widespread belief in the Republican Party that you can get the best of both worlds at this point. You can go as hard as possible shooting people at the border, drone strikes into Mexico, um, and animate the cultural base of the party that is so uh, un unsettled by, by the changing demography of the country. And you will not pay a price among Latino voters, because even if they disagree with those policies, enough of them will still vote for you if they think you are better on the economy. And right now, Latino voters are among the groups that are the most negative on Biden's performance on the economy. So part of what is driving this is the belief that it is a win-win politically. Could I just so, um, <laughs> um, I, 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 we need to go to Q&A. And so if there are people in the audience that have a question, please line up at the mic so I can tell how many of you there are and leave time for it. Um, we don't have any questions yet online, so I'm going to keep us going up here um, because Ron has now said some very provocative things. And uh, <laughs> it's only Ron can. And I wonder whether anybody else would like to speak to any of them. Angie, do you have anything to say? And then I have a question for Blouse. Yeah, um, I mean, a couple thoughts on the last point you were making regarding Latino voters. Um, I'm a Latino voter. You know, we're like everybody else. It's the economy. Um, and, you know, really good polling that was done by Equis showed that what Latino voters felt in 2020 that they didn't know in 2016 when they didn't vote for Trump is that he did better on the economy mm -hmm. and that he was quicker to open up uh, the, to, to call for reopening policies in the midst of COVID. Um, and that that gave them space, frankly, um, to vote for him. So I also think the other reason is that, again, there lacks a home base. There lacks a framework for understanding 
how, uh, how we can have a solutions-oriented immigration policy, and that's where we can stand, and then we can point to family separation, we can point to the hypocrisy of the Republican Party, and I think Latino voters are gonna be smart enough to see where they should go. Um, that's, that's what's lacking. The second point I wanna make is that I get that we're not gonna get legislation next year. I've been to this rodeo just a few times. Um, but I also know what it took after 9-11 to get us to where we were in 2006, which is where House member James Sensenbrenner got a quick vote on the House that would have made felons of all the undocumented. The Senate's answer to that was something that John McCain and Ted Kennedy, who I just pray to every day, um, devised, started on the House side, went over to the Senate, which was comprehensive immigration reform. That blunted Sensenbrenner. And what they also, what also happened organically, and this is just beautiful, it really should be taught um, in civics classes, is many of you might remember that immigrants, undocumented and otherwise, they marched, mm -hmm. right? They wore white, they wore, waved American flags, there was no <laughs> violence. And they're like, we, we belong, we're not felons, we're family. And it was that confluence that was wildly powerful. That's what I think we can get back to. And is it going to happen in 2024? Nope. 2025? No. 2026? Maybe. But if we don't start now, we're only going to get more of the same. Linda, did you want to speak to this? Yes, I, I would. Yes, I, I yes. would. I, I think the, the uh, major difference, uh, and it's really a positive trend uh, that's happened on uh, the progressive side of the aisle, is that I think as Ron suggested, much of the opposition to immigration is based on cultural factors, on the, again, misperception that, for example, Latino immigrants never learn English. Again, that's wrong, they do. And by the third generation, just like Italians, Greeks, Poles, and others before them, uh, the grandchildren of immigrants uh, from uh, Latin America, uh, prefer English as their dominant language. But the fact that uh, I think progressives now understand that when you march, you don't war march with a flag of Mexico or El Salvador, you war march with a, an American flag, that uh, you talk about the importance of uh, American culture and of immigrants becoming Americans uh, in their identity. All of these things, I think, will help us get to where we need to get. We can't um, create the sense that we are going to have a balkanized America in which all groups you know, retreat to their own little uh, subgroups uh, and we have nothing in common with each other. And I think for too long, that was the message that was coming out of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. I think they're finally getting the message. I hope it's gonna play uh, a role in getting more Americans to understand how important it is to have uh, these newcomers here because they are our future. Standing here and then we'll go over here. Please introduce yourself. Yes, hi, thank you. I'm Eugenie de Patspelti, um, Executive Director of the Association for the Rights of Household and Farm Workers. Uh, we launched last week a constitutional challenge of closed work permits, uh, employee type work permits on the basis that it violates uh, individual rights not to be held in servitude. Um, if anyone wants to hear more about that later, I'm around. Um, but also the timing was good because there was a UN rapporteur, human rights rapporteur, who went to Canada last week also and said the closed work permit was just breeding grounds for modern slavery. So uh, when we talk about temporary workers as like a solution, do we also include some reflection on what kind of permits we want to issue? And yes, okay, open work permits that lead to permanent status, that's one thing, but on free labor regimes, growing ones, is it really the United States that is envisioned? So I would like, yes, to hear a little bit more the panelists about that. Laz, why don't you say a little bit about what the administration's view is on issues of uh, temporary workers? Yeah, thanks for that question. I mean, I, I think 
we have been committed to working within our statutory authorities when it comes to providing you know, employment authorization documents to individuals who come to the United States. And it's important to note that there are statutory limits to what uh, we are able to do. Uh, you know, the law provides, for example, that your asylum uh, claim has to be pending in the courts for 180 days before you can be issued an EAD. I think what we are seeing is how long it takes people to get to the point where they have an application pending in the court can be a full year or longer. Uh, and we've been trying to work uh, with the states and the local governments to educate uh, individuals about the process in order to um, and you know increase the uptake, I would say, in EADs. Uh, we have also, as I think everybody knows through our CHNV, the Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, Venezuela parole process, uh, those individuals who come in through those processes can apply for EADs uh, you know, within uh, uh, when they enter, uh, basically, and they can be issued EADs pretty quickly. Um, however, you know, we are also cognizant that there's active litigation, frankly, from both directions in the space, as is so often uh, the case uh, for uh, DHS and for immigration issues. And so, you know, I, I can't really say much more um, than that. I, I will say if I if I can uh, monopolize the mic for one second and respond to something Ron said, which I think is right. Uh, you know, I setting the we are clear eyed that it is unlikely that Congress will move. We will continue to push for congressional action and try to put the onus on Congress, which is frankly where I think it belongs mm -hmm. here. But we're also committed to working within uh, our statutes in innovative ways to try to, uh, you know, provide more lawful access to the country. You're seeing that right now through the secure mobility offices, which I, I should have mentioned earlier, which is a, a new and I think a really innovative and potentially transformative process that we're setting up in the region uh, with our international organization partners, where we are providing people a place to go uh, in different countries uh, where they can apply for protection uh, in the United States, but also in other countries like Canada and Spain. And they can also apply for lawful pathways, uh, you know, labor pathways to countries uh, as well. Uh, we're just getting these centers off the ground. So in its early days, but they do, I think, hold a lot of promise. We're hearing from our partners around the world. Um, you know, first world countries have labor, acute labor shortages, as do we. And there's really a huge imperative for all of us to try to connect, you know, our labor pathways with people who have the requisite skills. And that changes by country and every, it's very complicated. But the IOs, I think, are really, you know, IOM and UNHCR are really well positioned to help us try to connect migrants with these opportunities. And so we're committed to exploring that uh, kind of approach, you know, even as we um, are hemmed in a little bit by the statutory constraints that we, we have to deal with every day. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because it's one of the questions that's been on my uh, uh, list. There are so many innovations that are uh, underway and um, they can't all yield, you know, results immediately, but it's really important to have a mid, you know, near term, midterm and longer mm -hmm. term strategy here, which uh, which those mobility offices, I think, uh, uh, exemplify. Um, question over here. Hi, thanks so much, Elaine Wood. I'm the chief legal officer at Heyman Woodward. We focus on employment based visas. My question is about the people camped out at the Roosevelt Hotel uh, with children and adults, and they're looking to send their children to school and people are just sitting around. And I'm wondering about solutions, right? So we're hearing about expanding temporary protected status. We're hearing about work permits. My firm's doing a lot of pro bono for asylum petitions, but what I'm realizing is that sometimes for affirmative asylum, what's happening is that the client actually isn't super eligible, but by the time four to six years processes, look, they've had work, which might be better than camping out at the Roosevelt Hotel, right? So in addition to what we've heard in the media or from someone like AOC about expanding temporary protected status, getting work permits. What can I do at my firm, let's say, besides do more pro bono for asylum? Um, 
to help people move into EB1, EB2, EB3, EB4. Um, there's a lot of people who legitimately are qualified, and I'm wondering how to sort of bridge that gap between people that are borderline public charge, just sitting around with our kids, and my firm, right, where we can really help mm. people. Thanks. Okay, that's, um, uh, I'm glad that you asked that question because it converges with a question coming in from online and we want to try to be responsive to our online audience as well. And that came in a slightly different uh, but uh, related form of what is the administration doing um, to improve reception uh, in the U.S. to meet the needs of changing populations? And these are some examples of it. Blas, can you speak to that? And Angie, if you would have anything to add, sure. uh, yep. let's have you add. Sure. Yeah, well, first of all, thank thank you for the work uh, you're doing because it is frankly critical. And and we, I think, again, this is a space that is 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 challenging for all of us because of just the idiosyncrasies of of the the way these statutes kind of interact, especially when it comes to employment authorization and especially when it comes to ways to transition, you know, to other uh visa categories. I, I wish I had a magic wand. I, I really um, I don't hear. I think we've been we've been uh, trying to work, as I said before, really closely with our state and local partners and uh, private sectors and the NGOs to try to provide more education to migrants about what those options are uh, for them. Um, it's clearly an uphill battle and one that we're committed to continue to wage. In terms of reception in general, uh, I think this is another one where you know we have been uh, provided funding by Congress. Um, through the Emergency Food and Shelter Program and, and the new SSP program that we're standing up uh, to uh, provide uh, financial assistance to state, local governments, and NGOs to help with uh, sheltering and transportation of migrants. We, However, we recognize that that is really just a, a drop in the bucket uh, compared to what is needed. Uh, and uh, there are things that we, the federal government, really can't pay for and that we, can, we rely on, on local partners to to pay for, and obviously all those uh, partnerships and, and systems are under an enormous strain right now. I mean, I, I, I'll be honest, I, I view these as the cost of just our fundamentally broken uh, immigration system. And uh, while we're doing our best to try to uh, address some of these infirmities in the system, um, and we keep saying it, but I'll, I'll say it until I'm blue in the face, that we're never, we're never gonna solve it without um, meaningful uh, work in Congress. This is going to have to be a closing comment. Angie, do you want to add anything to that on reception? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, we just need we need more players on the field. Like somebody said it earlier, we need to have an all of government and civil society response. Um, I think the administration has to redesignate Venezuela for TPS. I think other countries should also get TPS. It's a strong legal platform to stand on. And like, come on, like we have so many people with TPS and there's been no blowback to that. So it's it's not politically dangerous at all. It's, it's politically smart. And we need to give work authorizations to people faster, particularly those who have come in with a two-year parole. They're eligible to get them right away. And I also think we need to find ways that we can take the, the keys away from Abbott. And this administration needs to start working with cities and localities and, and, and do its own transportation. Um, I, I mean, I go on and on about what Congress should do, but we all know that it's constipated. Um, sorry. Um, state and local governments, I mean, come on, they need to step up and give money to attorneys and to legal service providers so we're not having to rely on the pro bono efforts of so many lawyers, particularly ALA lawyers. Philanthropy, there's a lot of money in New York, folks. Come on, they need to be giving money to local NGOs, again, for service providing, for making sure that people get what they need so they can get their kids in school, they can get housing, and they can show up in court, right? Because we need to see the process through. And um, we also need to consider the sponsorship program, which again, I mentioned before was working so well. There are Americans that wanna help. They just need a legal orderly system to know how they can do it. And finally business, like, you know, yes, you need workers, we'll stop whining. Like figure out how you can connect with these, with these um, new migrants as quickly as possible. Anyway, just some quick thoughts. <laughs> Yes, I've been thinking about it just a little bit. All right. Well, thank you to the panelists and thank you for whetting our appetites mm -hmm. for the rest of the day as we dig more deeply into these issues. We'll take a break now and um, come back at 1050, if you could. For those people who were not able to ask their questions, feel free to come up and speak with the speakers. See you again at 1050. Mm -hmm. Thank you.